This week on Community Chat, Hagen Norris PLC truck wreck and brain injury lawyers is speaking with attorney Allison Mahoney, owner of ALM Law. Allison is formidable in court as a litigator and advocate for victims of civil rights violations, sexual assault, sexual harassment, revenge porn, and Title IX claims of sexual assault and school rights. If this has happened to you or someone you know, Allison is the one to call. If you're an attorney and you're taking on these types of cases, Allison is the one to work with. She is here to talk about her journey starting ALM Law, what it's like to be a client of hers or to work with her, and a training tidbit for the community. Welcome, Allison. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Caitlin. Well, I'm so glad to have you. You're a friend of mine, and I trust you immensely when it comes to these types of cases. They are very serious cases, and it takes a true advocate to be able to do these. One, having the emotional intelligence to do it, the empathy, and also the knowledge of the law. And so I've learned so much from you. But let's just dive in to figure out, like, where did you even, you know, think to start ALM Law, think to do this type of really emotional work? What's your journey? It's been a winding journey. And when I graduated from law school, um, I never would have believed that I would have started my own firm at this point. Um, That was not something that I was planning on. Um, Right after law school, I worked in big law in New York City as a litigation associate. While I was there, I became very involved with the pro bono committee and was taking on more and more pro bono public interest cases involving survivors of sexual abuse and domestic violence. Um, And it quickly became apparent to me that I wanted to work on social justice issues full time rather than as just a piece of my practice. So I left and I was a prosecutor in New York City for a couple of years. Um, I was in a sex crimes bureau and then in a rackets bureau where we investigated organized crime and public corruption. Um, And of course, a piece of that is human trafficking. So I spent quite a bit of time investigating human trafficking rings. After the DA's office, I wanted to find a way to represent survivors and victims directly. And there's only a handful of ways to do that. And one of them that I found was to represent children. I joined an organization called Lawyers for Children, which I have so much respect for LFC. It's based in Manhattan. We represented abused and neglected children who were in foster care in New York City. I started as a staff attorney. Um, Then I started handling appeals at the office on top of my regular caseload and eventually became our project attorney for all of the office's sexual abuse and ex- sexual abuse and sexual exploitation cases. Um, and in that role, I served, I was kind of the in-house expert for other attorneys whose cases touched upon those issues. I worked with a couple of social workers who specialized only on those cases. Um, and it was just, it was incredibly rewarding work. And one important thing that will, I think, feed into my answer to your next question is that Lawyers for Children, on every single case, we were paired a lawyer and a social worker, and we worked together. And so I really learned a lot about the nuances of trauma-informed legal practices during my time there. Um, At LFC, however, I was seeing the same issues pop up over and over and over in court, systemic issues involving foster care in New York City. And so I joined, I left and joined an organization called A Better Childhood, which at the time was brand new, uh, A Better Childhood, but it was started by a lawyer who developed the whole body of case law in this area. But we investigated child welfare systems all over the country and then would file civil rights class actions against constitutionally defective foster care systems with the hope of reforming how they functioned. And so we looked at things like how many kids were sent to out-of-state residential facilities, which systems were not investigating abuses that were occurring within the foster care system adequately, which systems didn't have enough caseworkers, which systems had a skyrocketing number of kids entering foster care and staying in foster care. I led um, two of our class actions, one against Indiana and one against West Virginia. And it was fascinating, fascinating work. I loved the investigative piece. Um, It involved a lot of writing. 
uh, complex motion practice. We partnered with local law firms and large law firms. Um, and towards the end of my time there, I had been promoted to be the interim deputy director of our office. Um, and we had an appeal go up to the fourth circuit, which I helped to oversee. And then I decided to leave. This was during the pandemic. I had moved out of New York city to Colorado. I decided to leave. Um, at the time I was not licensed yet in Colorado. I opened up a PR firm, uh, which is still in operation. Um, and my inspiration for it was my time at A Better Childhood. We worked closely with the media on our cases and I saw the positive impact that could have on both our cases and for our clients. So for instance, we had a client who had a long form piece written about him in the Washington Post. And it was a really powerful way for him to finally tell his story and be heard. Um, so that's what prompted me to start my PR firm, which is called a story agency with an E. Um, when I was finally licensed in Colorado, I started a victims rights and civil rights law firm, ALM Law, which I opened um, around December of last year is when I really started to focus on it. And at ALM Law, I represent survivors of abuse, helping them to share their stories, achieve justice, and regain control of their lives, which is that last piece is especially important. Well, I think that's fantastic. I think your your journey is exactly why you are so credible, you are so authentic, and you have um, a unique ability to connect with people. And that leads me to the next question of what is it like Twofold. What is it like to have a law firm and to co-counsel with you on these cases? But also, what is it like to be your client? What is it like to be the victim that has been scared to maybe report anything to the, the thought of bringing charges or a claim against somebody is terrifying? You know, what do you talk to them in that initial meeting um, about this? And, you know, what is what is it like ultimately to be working with ALM Law? That's a great question. Um, so to answer the first piece about co-counseling with other law firms, I do co-counsel with other lawyers quite regularly on my cases. I'm selective about who I co-counsel with, as I'm sure other lawyers are as well. I think it's really important, especially on these types of cases, to work with someone who you can have a really good working relationship with and trust and just work smoothly together and understand the issues. Um, I enjoy co-counseling with people who have a skill set that um, is complementary to mine, or maybe they fill in gaps about an area of law that I don't have as much expertise in, but they do. And then I'm able to satisfy that other missing piece. Um, but when I co-counsel with clients or with, with uh, other attorneys, um, the working relationship can really vary. In some cases, I very much take the lead. In others, it's a 50-50 split. You know, it, it can be flexible depending on the needs of the case, what the client wants, and what works for the attorneys given their workloads. For clients, um, so I think the first thing to recognize is that these are really challenging cases. And I mean, challenging emotionally and they deal with or involve a lot of trauma. My cases are cases that involve sexual abuse, image-based sexual abuse, which revenge porn is the term, the common term that we hear for that. Um, children in foster care or in delinquency facilities who have been harmed during their time in those facilities, Title IX cases, um, those are the types of cases that I focus on and, and of course some domestic violence. Um, and so during my initial meetings with clients, I always make sure they understand that there's complete confidentiality and that they can trust me to not share what they're telling me with anyone else. And I also let them know that I appreciate that they're even willing to share this sensitive information with me, who is a, pretty much a stranger at that first meeting. And I tell them that they don't need to tell me everything right off the bat. I know a lot of these subjects are really difficult for people to talk about. And I never want to re-traumatize someone 
by making them recount their story over and over again or at a time when they're not ready. And so I tell clients that we can take it as slow as they want, of course, keeping in mind things like statute of limitations and whatnot. Um, and the other important thing that I try to convey to my clients who typically are plaintiffs in these cases is that this is an instance where they are in control. They are in the driver's seat. We can just do pre-litigation negotiations if we want, if they, we want to file. That's their choice. Everything is they are in they are in control of the situation, and I think that's something that is very important for people to remember and to understand, especially when they've been victimized in the way that many of my clients have been. I think that's fantastic, and you really do a subtle approach with your clients to make them feel comfortable. And it is one of the first times that they have control uh, because some of your relationships involve you know superior. Uh, to inferior relationships. Um, and what that would lead to is we maybe don't know a lot about these cases. Maybe there is a friend, a family member um, that could be the perfect client for you. We just really don't know what to look for. What's a good training tidbit uh, just for the community at large? For the community, community at large, I think um, if if you have a friend, a family member, a colleague who has potentially been impacted by any of these issues, first of all, knowing, letting them know that they have supports um, is really important. Supports in the community, friends, family, coworkers, but also that they have options to talk to a lawyer. And I don't charge for my initial consultations with clients. Um, at least right now, that's not my practice. And so if someone just needs information and to know the options that are out there, I am a resource for them where I can tell them, okay, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And these are your choices. You can opt to pursue any of them, none of them. It's totally up, up to you. Um, and I think survivors of abuse also often don't understand the array of legal remedies that they have. Um, if they're interacting with the police, for instance, and or with the DA's office, they have certain protections in place um, under the Victims' Rights Act in Colorado, and other states have similar um, statutes that protect victims. Um, so there's, there's that to be aware of. There are civil remedies, there's protection orders, there are, there's just a host of options. If someone is in a school setting, there's Title IX remedies. Um, and so it's, I, I think that it can be overwhelming for people at times, but they have a lot of choices available to them. Well, I think that's fantastic. And if you happen to be an attorney and you have one of these cases, but it's a one-off case, you decided to take it in the way that Allison is trained, you know, what would your tip be for attorneys that may have these cases and feel a little underwater? With I think to co-counsel. I think, I think that's the best thing that someone can do if they want to stay on the case. Co-counsel with someone who has the expertise. Um, and if they don't want the case, then they can refer it out. Um, but I think I think working alongside someone at the very least who understands the nuances of these uh, these types of cases is really important. Excellent. Especially, well, who, especially who understands trauma. Yeah. Well, I think that's fantastic. And in the show notes, we will include all your contact information for the community at large to reach out to you or possible lawyers that want to co-counsel with you. But just right now, if anybody's listening, what is the best way to reach you? Um, the best way is there. Well, there's two ways. The best way is on my website. There's a contact form, and my website is almlawllc.com. And um, I think it's the last tab on the website has a contact form, and that goes. Um, it gets it gets funneled to me eventually. So that's that's the best way to reach me. All right. Well, perfect. Thank you, Allison, so much for joining us. Thank you.